Chapter 6 Tipping the Scale Inflection points need to be pursued. Look around the bend, spot trends, set the bar high and build a team and a culture forward-focused on scale. Tailwinds come from hard work, preparation and a willingness to seek out and take advantage of growth opportunities. The bigger, the better. From my early days at Grant Road, when I collected money for the invites I sold to friends and neighbors to watch premieres from my grandparents' balcony, I've been fascinated by scale in business and in life. Creating scale in business, that is, finding the inflection point that allows your products or ideas to grow into their markets, has to become as much part of your daily routine as strategy, team building, and planning for your capital needs. When a business morphs from an innovative and disruptive idea to one that seeks growth, the cycle begins to feed itself. Think of this as tipping the scale, an entrepreneur's ability to brainstorm and build a bigger, better business. Starting a business, building and growing one, and scaling one all require radically different thinking. There are three totally different disciplines with their own unique DNA. You have to be brutally honest in your assessment of whether you are a starter, a grower, a scaler, or a combination of the three. You can grow into all three depending on the quality and caliber of the team you attract along the way and how you empower that team. You could be a professional with 10 years of experience and therefore feel you are a grower and scaler. If that's the case, find a co-founder or colleague who can be a great startup person, as this would be a winning combination for the future. Remember, the scope of your vision and the extent to which you can honestly assess yourself will limit or unleash your company's potential. But how do you spot inflection points? And most importantly, how do you cause them. First, understand that inflection points exist. Most entrepreneurs get stuck in a groove from time to time, finding a comfortable niche and sit tight in it. Inertia stops, inertia stops many people from thinking big. Bodies at rest tend to stay at rest unless acted upon by some outside force. In the same way, modest success for a business in a small market the fact that it happens to be a big fish in the small pond compels many entrepreneurs with otherwise far-reaching vision to stay put. That's when the excuses for not scaling a business start tumbling out. Funding woes, getting diluted too early, a misjudgment of the potential size of the market, an inability to find the right team, and just about anything else under the sun. These excuses only reflect a low level of ambition, and a lack of confidence in your ability and potential as an entrepreneur. Nothing wrong with that if that's your goal. Five years from now, though, do you want to be doing exactly what you're doing today? Most people would answer with an emphatic no. For me, scale is the first benchmark. In fact, if you're not looking at scale, you really don't need a strategy, for you're focused on the here and now, not the future. Scale and strategy are inextricably linked. The question I ask myself when I look at scale is, what's my differentiator? In today's fast-changing world, you can have a great idea, product, or execution strategy, but without a way to differentiate your idea from all the others in the market, scale will be elusive. I've known a ton of entrepreneurs who have blamed market size or the company's nascence for not breaking out to scale. But for a clearly differentiated product, service, or offering, Ambitions and visionary entrepreneurs will always find a scalable market. Start with these questions if you haven't asked them already. How big do I want to be? What will it take for me to get there? How am I preparing myself to build my business to scale? Ambition leads to sacrifices. You can't have one without the other. Those with more ambitious goals will generally be more willing to make sacrifices to reach those goals. Everybody dreams about scoring the finals winning run in a cricket test match or a goal in the football World Cup. In the same way, entrepreneurs hope one day to head impactful global businesses.
I faced many inflection points on my entrepreneurial journey. Nine times out of ten, I've sought them out. Maybe once the inflection point has sought me. I know this is true for most entrepreneurs who build businesses of size. Inflection points need to be pursued. Look around the bend, spot trends, set the bar high, and build a team in a culture that is forward-focused on scale. Of course, it helps to be in the right place at the right time when you're thinking scale and inflection points. But tailwinds arise from hard work, preparation, and seeking out opportunities. The quest for scale has come naturally to me, even during my first days in cable TV in the early 1980s. Back then, the hurdles were many. How do you explain cable television and choice to customers who have never held a remote in their hands? never changed a channel? How do you find stability and scale in a business where regulations don't exist? To sell the concept of cable TV, we set up hundreds of demos in building lobbies across the city, bringing residents their first taste of technology and choice in content. Over the next 12 months, we did over 1,000 demos and more than 3,000 door-to-door visits before we got our first connection. At that pace, we saw it would take years to get to critical mass, forget scale. So we took two initiatives to get us on our way. First, we targeted every hotel in the country for cable service. A no-brainer, really. Convincing one or two decision makers in a hotel chain to come on board would get us 10,000 more paying rooms. Once a few hotels subscribed, the peer pressure for all the others to follow would make cable television a standard amenity. Of course, the problems and challenges we faced were even larger than anticipated. 10,000 multi-channel television sets were a real strain on the production output of manufacturers at that time. Also back then, even the grandest of hotels didn't have television sets in their rooms. Since not every customer would pay extra for the service, Hotels knew they would have to bear the cost. The other big question for the hotel chains was whether to install black and white TV sets or wait for color. That slowed decision making and hampered our ambition for scale. We needed to work with hotels to allay their concerns as well as manufacturers to increase their production. Now you might ask, why are both these your problems as you try to build your own business? My response? If you're clear about scale and aggressive about your plans, you have to make these concerns your problems too. And we did. As compensation for the additional costs incurred by the hotels, we introduced an advertisement channel that allowed the hotels to cross-promote all their other properties as well as each of their restaurants. The idea worked. Even today, you see that channel in most hotel televisions. Once the manufacturers knew we were serious and the hotels were ready to make a massive purchase, they saw this as a once-in-a-decade opportunity. After a year of hard work, hard selling and patience, we convinced most of the major chains across India to buy in. I had another motive for the hotel's initiative. Once our core audience experienced cable television when staying in a hotel they would be far more likely to want the same service upon returning to their own homes. Selling to individual homes, the idea went, would become easier. And it did. Second, within nine months of our first connection, we had already expanded rapidly. Even so, we got a lot of customer feedback on the price point. Our charge was rupees 200 per month per home for the service, more than a princely sum at that time. To put this in perspective, cable TV charges across India in 2014, more than 30 years later, averaged 150 rupees to 200 rupees. Of course, in 1981, cable television was a unique offering. For the next few weeks, after listening to our customers and considering our options, I went on all customer calls to their homes that were willing to sign up at rupees 200 as well as to those who resisted subscribing at that price point. The solution was clear. Within a month, we launched a second tier of our basic service, offering a lower price of 150 rupees. We also upgraded the 200 rupees service to a premium one, with an extra hour of telecast time and more tangible bells and whistles. 
On an airline, everyone flies to the same destination in first class or economy. We positioned ourselves using that model in cable television. In essence, offering economy and first class subscriptions. If I had not personally gone for all those sales calls, where some didn't want to even let us through the door, and many asked us to come after 9pm, the idea of dual pricing would not have popped into my head. We tripled our business in the ensuing year, keeping the competition that had joined the fray by then at bay while scaling our business. Sometimes scale comes from necessity. In UTV's early days, the core was creating TV shows. Since there was only the state broadcaster Doordarshan, we were limited to creating 13 to 26 episodes at a time before cooling our heels for months. In 1991, with the Gulf Wars coverage on CNN, satellite television was drawing attention across Asia. A year later, India launched its first satellite channel, ZTV. Tracking its progress and liking what we saw, the creative team and I gathered to make our pitch to Z. In the middle of the meeting, I threw down the gauntlet. We would pitch to do 10 shows for the launch, provided we were given a minimum commitment of one year's run per show. 52 episodes of 10 shows are a staggering 520 episodes in total. We wanted scale. This was our chance. My idea was met with skepticism, to say the least. But over the next month, as everyone warmed to the task, we brainstormed over 20 ideas. The month after that, we pitched all of them and came back with a contract for 520 episodes spanning 10 shows at budgets that were a win-win for both us and ZTV. But nothing's that simple. Our creative ideas stuck a chord. But why would a client, himself a pioneer, place his trust in our company with what would account for almost 40% of all that he was commissioning? What was in it for the client to give us scale? We needed an answer to both these questions before we pitched, while at the same time continuing to excel creatively. To preempt the first concern, my approach was to pitch each concept separately with its own captive team, as if it were the only thing we had on our plates and so could give it our all. We never pitched a bulk contract of multiple shows, no one-size-fits-all, no predetermined number of shows. In fact, the goal of 10 shows and 520 episodes was mine alone, internal with the team and not to be shared. Each team pitched with incredible passion. As our shows kept getting picked up, no one counting or ticking boxes on a master plan, the effect was cumulative. ZTV had independently and without connecting the dots greenlit 10 shows from one company. By the time they realized what had happened, we were ready with the offering of a cost advantage. Scale with us and avoid the challenges inherent in dealing with multiple production companies and additional costs. We had taken three months to prepare for this moment. Our creative offering was a mix of studio-based shows, games, quizzes and chats, coupled with dramas and soaps. For all studio-based shows, we could be cost-competitive by aiming to record five episodes a day versus one episode a day, the best anyone had accomplished. Our detailed plan came together with military precision. We knew we could pull it off. Six studio-based shows and four dramas and soaps. The cost at which we offered to do the six shows, provided we got all ten, and this was the time to play the scale card, not while creatively presenting, was rock bottom. As a cost package, it made total sense for ZTV to go forward. And we based on the economics of scale and brutally efficient execution, could come out with a decent margin too. No one in Indian television at that time had come close to creating content at that scale. But we were about to embark on one of the most ambitious experiments in the history of entertainment. The idea wasn't silly or maverick. We just recognized a rare opportunity and seized it. To succeed would mean never hesitating again to find scale in our operations. That one year, I don't think I've worked harder, slept less, worried more, or put more stress on our 500 team members to complete those various projects on time and on budget. 
The sheer logistics were daunting. It was like setting up 10 factories or distribution centers all at once. But unlike plants or warehouse, here I was dealing 24-7 with creative people and growing something out of nothing with talent and teams willing to be stretched to the limit. In such cases, Murphy's Law not only can, but most assuredly will apply. Still, we insisted that creativity and quality take precedence over cost, and we learned to manage multiple relationships. We had taken on a challenge without full clarity regarding how we were going to pull it off. The industry was absent in trained talent. So today, when I see the same struggle for quality talent in e-commerce, healthcare, education, agriculture, or big data, I can relate intimately. I lived that life for the better part of 10 years at a time when the media and entertainment industry was beginning to take shape. At the end of the day, just because a job hadn't been done before didn't mean we didn't have a plan to succeed and do the job well. We needed to be nimble at all times, get feedback, and make sure that bad news flowed up very fast. It was project management and multitasking at its core, and we enjoyed every minute of the pressure cooker experience. And in the end, we delivered 520 episodes as promised. Restless again and in need of an adrenaline fix, a couple of years later we launched India's first daily soap, Shanti. Clearly, we had learnt a few things. Who says B2B limits your scale? You're only limited by your willingness, or otherwise, to break barriers and scale new heights. And you need to stay hungry for scale, not just once, but all the time. Years after many of those forays into scaling, a mutual friend introduced me to a real maverick, Haim Saban. At the time, Haim had his own hugely successful animation and production company in the US, but his main claim to fame was Power Rangers, the top-rated series for kids worldwide that debuted in 1993 and has since spawned countless related series. Haim ran an animation powerhouse, and he was open to outsourcing his work to India. We met for dinner at the famous Japanese restaurant Matuhisa in Los Angeles. I experienced a strong sense of deja vu at dinner that night, recalling my visit to the brush factory in London, the trip that led to the founding of Laser Brushes. Now here's what makes exceptional entrepreneurs and what allows them to soar. Haim had had an amazing next decade, convincing Rupert Murdoch to a 50-50 joint venture to launch a kids' broadcast network. With Haim producing a bulk of the content, since News Corp had no presence in the 4-14 to 14 age group at all. Many years later, though, thanks to a combination of uncanny business sense, good fortune, and some favorable terms in their joint agreement, Haim and Murdoch sold their channel, which had grown in the US and Europe, to Disney for many billion dollars, taking Haim's media aspirations to a different league. All this built on the reputation and popularity of Power Rangers. We didn't have an animation facility in India as yet, but based on our comfortable chat that evening and on the strong recommendation of our common friend Jay Itzkovich, Haim and I agreed that we would deliver a trial order of 26 episodes of one of their up-and-coming series for production in our yet-to-be-created studios. So what was I thinking? Committing to a project with no setup? I had studied the market closely and knew that China and the Philippines had built large outsourcing studios for animation. In India, the IT sector was starting to grab global attention, and my slightly arrogant self felt that I had done this once before with toothbrushes, and so knew what it would take. In fact, I understood a lot more about animation than I knew about toothbrushes when I had taken the plunge years before. But most of all, I was clear and confident that I could create a talent base, build and empower a team, and grow the creative business to scale. Back in India, two days after our dinner in Los Angeles, I sat down with our team and discussed how we could create India's largest animation studio. The more I looked at all the aspects of the process, from creative to talent, the more I realized that we'd need to pioneer all the way. I envisioned a production facility 
large enough to cater to more than just the outsourcing of one animated show. As a start, I brought on board the father of Indian animation, the deeply experienced Ram Mohan. We hired a studio head and five division heads from one of the top studios in the Philippines before launching an academy to train 400 animators, all of whom would eventually work in the industry. The top floor of our office facility housed our cafeteria and some pool and table tennis tables. We shut this down and converted it into our animation floor. Recreation facilities would need to wait till we regrouped with more office space. In four months, we were in business. If my entrepreneurial DNA hadn't compelled me to keep scale at the top of my mind, I may not have taken up that initial contract without an animation facility. Nor would I have brought in global talent and scaled with hundreds of animators. It bears repeating. If you're not thinking scale, you don't need to think strategy. Our first quantum leap from TV production to broadcasting was with a Tamil channel and was also the first time I looked at growth via an acquisition. Everything I'd done till then had been built from the ground up. My colleague at Warburg Pincus, who had invested in UTV, called me one day and told me that Vijay Malia wanted to divest one of his channels. No guesses for figuring why it was called Vijay TV and wondered if we'd be interested. I joined my colleague for a meet with Vijay that very evening. Up until then, UTV hadn't given much thought to entering the channel space, certainly not in South India. But I wanted to understand more about Vijay's motivation and the opportunity. We landed at Vijay's seaside house at 11pm and got the royal treatment from his staff. Tied up earlier in the evening, Vijay arrived at 12.30am. When we finally sat down together, he appeared fresh, energetic and ready to hammer out a deal. He took my presence there not as a curiosity seeker, but as an interested buyer. For the next hour and a half, we listened to his pitch, his expectations, and his strategy to divest the channel. It was an informative meet, and over the next four weeks, we spent time in Chennai with our team, researching the details. We met with Vijay a couple of times later to discuss the transaction. The deal seemed like a good buy at a fair price, and I negotiated a deferred payout over two years too. It was a push, but it worked. Since our sales teams had worked closely for many years with the market leader Sun TV, we were familiar with the Tamil television space and knew a fair bit about Vijay TV from the outside. Our biggest challenge in putting together the deal was that Sun TV was our client and partner at that time. We produced content and sold airtime for them in four South Indian languages. In truth, our revenues with Sun was larger than the business we'd be buying at Vijay TV. It was important for me to appraise Sun TV of the developments with Vijay. During my meeting with the founder of Sun TV, the sharp, reclusive man of few words, Kalani Dimaran, I assured him of strong Chinese walls between our production arm and our broadcast initiative. To his credit, he took me at face value and gave me his trust. He always lived up to his commitment that we would not upset our business partnership as long as we maintained our confidentiality agreement. That settled, we acquired Vijay TV from Malia and spent the next 18 months growing it. Wanting to scale our initiative even further, I approached News Corp, Star TV, a partner and investor in UTV, with a proposal to join hands and look at the broadcast space in all four South Indian states. They had no presence in the South at the time, and Vijay TV would give them a good head start. Within three months, we had entered into a 50-50 alliance to work exclusively in the South Indian broadcast space. My learnings from those multiple negotiations with Vijay Malia, Sun TV and Star TV were vast. The headlines? 1. Don't get yourself in a desperate must-do situation and you'll always pay the fair and balanced value. When you don't have to consummate a transaction and have the choice to do so only on good terms, the negotiations are fairly balanced. With Vijay TV, we weren't buying a distressed asset. But as there weren't many suitors in play, we could negotiate a deferred payout. 2. 
Trust and credibility are crucial for building strong long-term business relationships and require some give and take. Both sides need to see a win-win situation for the long term. In this case, we needed Malia's trust, especially since we had a deferred payment and we were taking over the asset from day one. We had to earn Sun TV's continued trust regarding confidentiality as well. With News Corp, it was a David and Goliath joint venture, not something they would normally have done. In that case, we needed to be that credible partner. 3. When working with organizations that are clients in one business but competitors in another, strong Chinese walls are critical and must be built into your company's culture. And 4. Domain knowledge is important. But some quick steps, building an experienced team, fostering key alliances, and getting a strong review process in place will get you moving forward. After all, I did not understand Tamil or speak it. Our negotiation with Malia is one more illustration that inflection points are created. Scale is a reality only if you're always looking forward and not in the rearview mirror. In a span of two years, we were one of the largest content partners to the market leader Sun, a 50% owner in Vijay TV, and in a joint venture with one of the top global media companies for broadcasting in four South Indian states. On a lighter note, we signed the joint venture just a couple of days before my wedding. Since our deal with Star TV was big news at the time in the media, I agreed to a closed door press conference to make an announcement at the private room in the Taj Hotel, Mumbai between the wedding reception in the morning and the small reception and dinner planned for 250 to 300 guests at the Taj that evening. Press conference lasted an hour and a half. I then went across to look at the arrangements in the main banquet room, headed home, changed and headed back for our reception. While Zarina knew what I was up to all along, my in-laws and parents only figured it out the next day. Fun and heady days those were. Starting a movie studio was definitely the inflection point of scale for UTV and took the company to a different level. It was not by chance or accident this happened. It was a gutsy, out-of-whack decision, born of the realization that scale and brand creation were of paramount importance to us. In the first few years, we moved swiftly to build our movie slate and began to make our mark in the space. In 2006, the success of Rangde Basanti, which became a cult hit and made it to the top five box office hits of all time, was our turning point when we knew we had arrived in our movie-making journey. To celebrate, we released quarter-page advertisements on the front pages of all the national dailies. Most of the other movies we compared ourselves favorably with were by the two big directors and production houses then, Yashraj Studios and Karan Johar's Dharma Production. Touting box office success and comparing Rangda Basanti with other movies was taboo and, as I came to realize, a first for the industry. Everyone does it now, but back then, it was frowned upon. When the advert appeared, I got a polite but concerned call from Adi Chopra of Yashrat Studios. He suggested that he and Karan would like to meet me the next day at his office. I agreed. As I'd mentioned earlier, I have the highest respect for Yash Chopra and for his son, Adi. I also love what Karan does. In fact, my plans for UTV to get serious about movies emerged when I saw Karan's brilliant Kuch Kuch Hota Hai, a landmark movie. I sobbed through most of the second half and loved it and even sent a mail to Karan, whom I didn't know then. Although overseas, he replied promptly. That meant a great deal to me. All that was some years before our meeting regarding the advertisement. I walked into the room expecting a polite reprimand for raking up competitiveness in an industry that does not do these things. The meet was cordial but formal for the first half, but soon we all loosened up when it became clear that our intentions were pure. Adi and Karan loved Rangde Basanti and spoke of it with admiration. That day my respect for Adi and his dad only increased. Karan and I became not just great colleagues, but close friends. A month later, Yashrat Studios came out with a full-page advert, hyping their hits for the year and proclaiming themselves as the top movie production house. That ad 
inspired me to really think about scale for our own movie studio. Till then, as new kids in the block, it made sense for us to go step by step, feeling our way through unfamiliar territory. We now wanted to take a serious look at scale, not in any sort of competitive spirit, but to reach our own benchmarks. In typical UTV fashion, we shot for the stratosphere, envisioning a pan-Indian and global distribution organization. Of course, that would mean creating or co-producing 10 to 12 movies a year, at the time the largest production schedule or slate for any company in India. To a lesser extent, but no less important in the long run of sealing our reputation as aspiring industry leaders and outsiders, our modest inroads into Hollywood gave us a completely different profile when just about everybody else was still dissecting the insular and increasingly homogeneous market in India. The namesake, a 2006 Mira Nair film based on a novel by Jhumpa Lehri, and The Happening, written and directed by Manoj Knight Shyamalan, were tipping points for us. Director Meera Nair and I had known each other for some time and had stayed in touch over the years. One day I got a call from an excited Meera who wanted to meet. We settled on breakfast at Mumbai's Willingdon Club. A bundle of energy, Meera's positivity brims over with great ideas. And on this occasion, she could barely contain herself. She had recently stepped off a flight having read award-winning novelist Jhumpa Lehri's The Namesake, a story about a family's emigration from Calcutta to New York City and their subsequent struggles. By the time Meera had turned the last page, she wanted the book to be her next movie project. Zarina had read the book and loved it too, so indirectly I shared Meera's enthusiasm. Meera has a foot in both India and the US, and she thought it important to have an Indian connection for any production of the namesake. We ended our Parsi breakfast of Akuri eggs on a positive note and a promise to keep in touch. I picked up the book and read it over the next few days, drawn into a special story that had resonated with readers. I knew that if anyone could bring the novel's emotions and multi-layered relationships alive, Mira was the one. I told her so, and just like that, we were on. Although the namesake was an English-language Hollywood movie clearly targeting a Western audience, things moved rapidly over the next few months. Fox Searchlight, a division of 20th Century Fox, came on board when they recognized what we all saw in the book and in the script and screenplay that unfolded with some great writing by Meera and Sunita Raporwala. Within two months of our breakfast meet, with Fox taking the lead, we were hammering out an agreement in a conference room at their studio in Los Angeles. Mira was ready to roll. Before the ink had dried on the agreement, she had the film cast, including Irfan Khan and Tabu from India, and Cal Penn, who already had a connection with US audiences with his Harold and Kumar series, Zuleika Robinson, who debuted in The Namesake, and went on to do more great work, most recently in Homeland, was cast as the Bengali character of Moshami Mazumdar. The namesake made us proud. Mira took a fantastic book, screenplay and script to the next level of narrative performance. The film received positive reviews and did well at the box office. I expected it to do better worldwide, but it particularly resonated with audiences in the US. Based on that experience, I wanted to take our Indian connection in Hollywood to the next level. I had watched and loved The Sixth Sense, which totally disrupted the traditional Hollywood narrative. The life cycle of Manoj Knight Shyamalan's most famous film paralleled that of George Lucas's Star Wars. Like Lucas, who showed his film to every studio only to have it pass before Fox finally took it, Shyamalan confronted studio heads who were skeptical about his creation and whether audiences would get his vision. Much like Star Wars, The Sixth Sense became a breakout film and a massive hit. Shyamalan became a household name in filmmaking. A fan of Shyamalan's work, I wrote to him twice over two years, but got no response from him. On the third try, many years later, we connected. The first time we met was at the Four Seasons in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, after a 23-hour hop from Mumbai. 
Even though Shyamalan's movies look like they've been shot all over the world, most are filmed within miles of Philadelphia, his home for much of his life after being born in Mahe, Pondicherry. I arrived at the hotel at about 8 p.m. and was delivered the script of the happening to read on the condition that I wouldn't photocopy it or record portions of it under any circumstances. Shyamalan and I were to have breakfast at 7 a.m. the next morning. Jet lag or no, I ordered room service and read the script straight through that night before turning in. I carried the scripts with my notes down to breakfast the next morning and was pleasantly surprised to see Shamlin there with his wife and kids. Our meet and greet gave me a vibe of openness and transparency, which summed up night, as he is mostly called. He was grounded enough to hear comments and critiques on his script, even with his family there. Knight has a reputation as a quirky, eccentric character who listens to criticism but understands and trusts his own disruptive creativity. I found him quite pleasant, a loner, intensely confident and clear about what he wants to do. All traits I see in myself. From then on, I was confident about his intentions and comfortable about working together. Knight's first project, The Sixth Sense, was such an enormous hit that his second and future acts inevitably became more challenging. That's the dilemma in every aspect of life. To continue to better your act, even after tremendous success has led to the sort of scale you could only have imagined a decade before. Later, after watching the rough cut of The Happening in Los Angeles with my daughter Trisha, who was in film school there at that time, I met Knight at the Beverly Hills Hotel and was quite candid with some of my comments that the movie was a bit too long, credibility and reality got stretched towards the end, and the ending was underwhelming. He was curious, genuinely interested in my feedback, and open to the collaborative process films demand. By that time, we had built a good rapport. The Happening was a co-production with Fox and Spyglass, another strong Hollywood studio brand. The two go back a long way. Spyglass backed The Sixth Sense when no other studio would touch it. The happening grossed over 160 million US dollars at the box office, and much more with television and ancillary rights thrown in. In due course, we learned the hard way that the studios take the big profits with the distribution fees and more, and make reasonably one-sided contracts. But for a movie that was budgeted at a third of the box office, our experience with Shyamalan was another scale moment for us. Once you've built your business, you need to figure out what moves the needle. Finding scale isn't easy. If it were, every entrepreneur would pursue it. Most of us look at life in increments, so a jump to scale may be unfamiliar and uncomfortable. Just to be clear, I am not evangelizing or pushing you to think scale. Boutique is good, so is specialist. Where you end up depends upon your vision and the combined vision of your team and colleagues. You have to define your own sense of scale based on your sector, whether you want to create a brand and where you want to take it, and the aspirations of your team members. Now that you have the right approach, how will you train yourself to see inflection points and more importantly, create them? First, remember... Size and scale, vision and ambition come from the leader or the founder, no matter how big or small the organization may be. Sure, the team and colleagues may participate in the process, but only based on your lead as the founder. You apply a personal context to the scale you envision. As the owner or leader of the business, you and only you truly know its direction and velocity. Many of you might rely on consultants and advisors to tell you what you already know. That's fine, to a point. The external view is one facet, but at the end of the day, it boils down to your call as a leader. Also remember that while growing your own company, you are also growing the sector by adding value to the overall ecosystem, not just competing and conquering. The 21st century, governed by technology, the democratization of the consumer base and access to information is all about collaboration and winning, not killing the competition and taking it all as the winner. For me, your focus on creating a brand is a critical step on the journey to scale. 
This is not an easy task and far more complex than the common view would have it, that brand building requires little more than spending on marketing. But once you create a brand that stands for something, speaks of its own standards, has recall value with a large consumer base, and brings credibility to your service or product, it can be a great inflection point for your company. For instance, we wanted the UTV brand to stand for innovation and disruption from the start, exemplified by cutting-edge creativity, a diversified, synergistic entity spanning all aspects of media and entertainment. Part of the brand, of course, was the UTV logo, red, green and blue, the core colours that make up all visual pictures. Designing the logo, defining what it stood for and determining where it would appear was a subconscious brand builder. We never spent money on advertising the brand, but rather on shaping how our various audiences perceive the brand on myriad screens, mobile, laptops, tablets, television, the big screen and more. Ask a hundred people today what they recall about the UTV logo and specifically what it connotes. Their response, creativity, passion, ideas with energy, innovation, and especially guts. At our peak on a given day, the UTV logo would be on multiple television channels beamed across 40 countries and into more than 180 million Indian homes on 5,000 movie screens 100 million mobiles around the world, on the flights of 25 airlines and more. Entrepreneurship is a lot like life. Sometimes just asking the right questions presents you with half the solution. In this case, inviting you to see and seize opportunities you otherwise didn't know were in your grasp. That's why you choose to be an entrepreneur in the first place. You're accountable to the people who work for you, your consumers, and your investors. And because you understand scale, your vision includes an element of restlessness and an obsession for growth. Chapter Summary Starting an enterprise, growing one, and scaling one require radically different thinking. Be brutal about your own assessment and ambition levels and plan accordingly. As you scale, fine-tuning your company's differentiator is critical. Inflection points need to be pursued. They don't just happen. You have to stay restless. At each new level of scale, the organization will need your team's focus and your attention to understand the consumer firsthand. This is not the best time to be delegating or multitasking. The vision and velocity for scale must finally come from you as the leader. If you are clear about your brand strategy, it can work as a multiplier while building scale. If you are ready to scale, take the plunge, not once, but many times in your journey. So you're averse to risk, to hell with risk. Failure never stopped anybody who didn't want to be stopped.